Okay, thanks, Steve, and thanks, Imran. Um, so this, this talk that I'm going to give to you right now, this is a talk about why in an age of almost ubiquitous potential connectivity, so many people are still left out of global networks and debates and conversations. And it's a talk that's framed by the potentials of connectivity for people that are traditionally in the world's economic margins. Now, traditionally, information and knowledge about the world, they've been highly geographically constrained. And I think a good way to start talking about this is to look at a historical map. This one here is called the Carta Pisana. It's uh, from the 13th century. It was produced somewhere on the Italian peninsula. And what the map does, it displays, you probably can't make this out, but it displays relatively accurate information about the Mediterranean, less accurate information about the fringes of Europe. Great Britain, for instance, in the, the top left-hand corner is a strange rectangle. Um, and then no information at all about any parts of the world that are further afield. And the reason that I, that I want to start talking about this map is because I think it starkly illustrates some of the constraints placed on knowledge by distance. In the 13th century, transportation and communication technology, so in other words, ships and books, they allowed some of the constraints of distance to be overcome by the map's Italian cartographer, but, but those technologies just weren't effective enough to, to allow uh, detailed knowledge about the Americas, about East Asia, and about much of the rest of the world to be represented on this map. Now, not only have some parts of the world been traditionally left off the map, some parts of the world just also produce far more codified and transmittable knowledge than others. So if we look at present day patterns of the geographies of information and knowledge, what we see are some very uneven patterns. So for instance, this map here, it shows you the number of newspapers published per every thousand people. And what we basically see is that the world's wealthiest uh, countries, they have more per capita newspapers than the rest of the world. If we look at something like the distribution of academic journals, we see an even more vivid pattern of uh, the concentration of knowledge production in only certain parts of the world. This, this chart here uh, is a chart of all journals in what's called the Web of Knowledge Journal Citation Reports. This is probably the world's most influential collection of academic content. And what you basically see is that the, the United States and the United Kingdom publish far more index journals than the whole rest of the world combined. On this, this is a cartogram, and on, on this cartogram, you're looking at the, the same data, just in map form, with the size of each shape reflecting the number of journals in each country. Uh, that massive block on the left is the United States, the one just to the right of it is the UK, and then the, the big cluster blocks in the middle, those are all European countries. Basically, what you see is that outside of North America and Western Europe, most of the rest of the world scarcely shows up in these rankings. One of the starkest contrasts here is that there's more than three times as many uh, journals in Switzerland than the whole continent of Africa put together. Now, these, these highly uneven geographies of information they, they, that we've just seen, they shape what's known and what can be known. And this in turn influences all of the ways that knowledge is produced and reproduced and enacted and reenacted. The main problem though is that these two types of information inequality that I've just talked about, the production of knowledge from a place and the production of knowledge about a place, they can potentially start to reinforce each other as information and physical places become increasingly intertwined. So in other words, what I'm saying is that while the geographies of codified information have always mattered, they maybe matter more than ever now because of the ways that the digital and the material or the virtual and the real are increasingly woven together to produce these sorts of augmented spaces. And this is because there are many, many layers of computer code and digital content that help us to enact our being in this place and most other places in very specific ways. Now what I'm talking about is not just um, traditional maps of a place, but all of the layers of information that help us to understand and enact and reenact and produce and reproduce this place and lots of other places that we're in. Think about all of the content in Twitter, for instance, that's sort of floating above our heads right now, sort of shaping, if, if you're watching the Twitter stream of this place, shaping how, how you're imagining and thinking about what's going on here. Think about all of the Wikipedia articles about, uh, well, the, the one about this place and all of the Wikipedia articles about uh, all the other places that you're in. Think about the local social media and the, the four squares of the world. And of course, the ways that our digital shadows extend to all sorts of other bits of the web, like the ways that this place has been quite meticulously mapped out by volunteers on OpenStreetMap, and of course, also employees of Google and Microsoft and MapQuest and many other platforms. And then the ways that these maps 
also become the platform for an almost unimaginable amount of additional content about this place, like uh, the photos that people have tagged about the area, or the hundreds of videos that people have tagged throughout the city, or the street level digital photographs uh, of, of this place. And then, of course, what we're able to do is bring all of this information into our portable mobile devices. It can all augment the ways in which we bring the place into being whilst we're in the place, experiencing the place, enacting the place. And I think this is where we should talk about the potentials of the internet again, because it's quite old news that the internet reduces barriers to creating and publishing and sharing information, and so potentially allows us to overcome a lot of these informational inequalities that I was talking about, but it also allows us to augment the places and the cities that we live in with this sort of digital information, this, these digital shadows that I've been talking about. And so the point of this is that there's now undoubtedly both a literal and a metaphorical space for, for more locally relevant information about all of the rest of the world. Now, more broadly, what we know is that being connected can mean a lot of things to the world's poor. It can mean being able to access what Wikipedia refers to as the sum of all human knowledge. It can be sharing and uploading uh, local knowledge and contributing to global debates. And really, a lot has been said about all of the revolutionary possibilities of the internet to enable a global shift in the geographies of information. And I, I don't need to go into all of that, because I'm sure you've heard all of these um, debates before, but by theoretically radically reducing barriers to producing and sharing content, then you change some of these historical and geographical uh, types of stickiness of information, right? Well, that's that question is the question that I want to explore in the rest of the time I have here. And what I want to do is show you some data on who is and who isn't represented and participating on the internet. So let me just start out by showing you who's actually on the internet. This, is, this graphic's a fairly simple way of doing that. Each little person here represents 25 million internet users. So in other words, it shows us that if the internet were a village of, in this case, 62 people, there'd be 27 Asians, 15 Europeans, 10 North Americans, seven Latin Americans, and three Africans. That only tells you part of the story, though. This is a map of uh, global internet penetration that I made um, with Monica Stevens and Scott Hale. The size of each one of these boxes here, it represents the total number of internet users in a country. So you, you have uh, the Americas on the left, you have Europe and Africa in the middle, and you have Asia on the right-hand side. It's obviously very uneven. Lots of internet users in North America, Europe, and parts of Asia. And then you get most of the rest of the world, part, other parts of Asia, South America, all of Africa, with very low total numbers of internet users and internet penetration. And a lot of this unevenness came about because of the actual geographies of internet infrastructure. Some parts of the world just lack the physical connections necessary to be well connected to the global grid. So this, this is a map of uh, submarine fiber optic cables around Africa in the year 2009. Uh, you can see, uh, well, m everywhere is, is fairly uh, poorly connected. But if you look at East Africa in particular, there wasn't, there wasn't even a single fiber optic cable running into that part of the world. It was the last part of our planet, that didn't, or less major part of our planet, that didn't have a single fiber optic cable running into it. But a lot of these infrastructural constraints are being addressed. This is the landing site of the first fiber optic cable that went into Kenya. This is the, the port of Mombasa about two years ago. Um, this guy, Mahmoud, he was kind enough to, to let me take this picture. Down that hatch are all of the, the, the cables that enable East Africa's connectivity. And so because of all this building work, this is the same map of the region's connectivity now. And if we look at internet penetration rates over time, what we see is an incredible narrowing of what some people call digital divides. Internet penetration growth rates in poor countries are impressively high. An important question to ask then is whether the now 200 million internet users in Latin America, the 100 million in Africa, the almost a billion in Asia, whether people are using this new connectivity to address many of these informational inequalities that characterize or have characterized modern media. Are all of these relatively new users now represented by relevant information? Are they able to access the, the information they need? Are they contributing to global discussions and debates that are taking place? We've already looked at some of the very uneven geographies of traditional media and information sources. Well, let's now look at the geographies of, of knowledge and representation and participation on the internet. And let me begin with the internet gateway that most of us probably use, and that's Google. 
what you're looking at here is a measure of the online content that, that people are creating about anywhere on Earth and then gets indexed by Google Maps. So obviously a, a brighter color here means that there's more, more stuff indexed about that place in Google. And you get an indication of the massive amounts of unevenness in these layers of information that surround us. Dense clouds of information over some parts of the world, very little over other places. Some parts of the world are just basically just swimming in information, and others have no digital shadow or digital existence at all. And this map, though, it just shows you content. It shows you all the content, content in all languages. That's not that useful. None of us speak all languages. So what's maybe more useful is to segment this content by language in, in order to get a better sense of um, who can access it all. So um, I've been working with um, Matthew Zook to study the, amount, the relative amount of content produced about the same places in different languages. And a lot of the results kind of show you things you'd expect to see. This map shows the geography of English versus French content in Eastern Canada. Uh, a dot, uh, dot colored red means that there's more English content about that, that place. A dot colored blue means that there's more French content about that place. And you kind of see what you'd expect to see here. More English content about Ontario, more French content about Quebec. And I can show you maps like this from all over the world. Um, here's just one more. This is Belgium. And this shows you uh, a place with more Flemish content has an orange dot, a place with more French content has a blue dot. And what you then see is that this geolinguist geolinguistic mapping, it almost perfectly mirrors the divisions between Flanders and Wallonia. So the point is that in some cases, the internet's sort of reflecting broader social and cultural patterns and practices. But what about a part of the world where there are more unbalanced power dynamics between different linguistic groups? This is a map of Arabic and Hebrew in Israel and the Palestinian territories. A blue dot indicates more Hebrew content, a red dot indicates more Arabic content. And basically what you see is that, what this all shows us is that while Arabic and Hebrew content tends to annotate the same physical places, there's really a much denser cloud of Hebrew content over almost all of those places. And the point of this is that there's not only a paucity of online information about a lot of the developing world, but of that information that exists, a lot of it's just not accessible to a lot of people. What about more explicitly user-generated content online, though? This might give us a better sense of who is and who isn't participating and sharing knowledge and creating content. So this is a map of photographs in Flickr. And Flickr is the world's, the world's most popular photo sharing service. Uh, the brighter dots on this map indicate that there's lots and lots of pictures about taken about that place. The darker dots mean that there's only a few, and no dots at all mean that there's well nothing at all taken about that place. And you again see very stark inequalities in the amount of content that people are creating about our world, even when we're looking at user-generated content that theoretically any one of the two billion people who are on the internet can create and share. But a maybe more important platform for how we gain knowledge about our world is, is visualized here. This is a map of content created in Wikipedia. And Wikipedia is important to look at um, because it's very powerful, very, very visible content. It's, it's content that, that sort of permeates a lot of the corners of the web. Um, it's a website that 15% of all of, of any of the 2 billion people online access on any given day. So, on this map, uh, darker shading means that there's more articles written about that place in Wikipedia. Lighter shading means that there's fewer written about that place. And you can again see it's highly uneven. Some parts of the world characterized by these highly dense virtual representations, others barely represented at all. And you, you can again see that almost all, almost all of uh, Africa is poorly represented in Wikipedia again. There are remarkably more Wikipedia articles written about Antarctica than most countries in Africa. There's more Wikipedia articles written about fictional non-existent places like Tolkien's Middle Earth than a lot of countries in the developing world. Um, you, you get a sense of the scale of these inequalities on this cartogram here. This, uh, this, so it's a cartogram again, so what that means is the size of the shapes uh, indicates the total number of Wikipedia articles in a country. The giant block on the left is North America. The even bigger one in the middle, those are all the European countries. The top right of um, your screen, you're seeing Asia. And then crunched into the bottom left, you see South America and Africa. And what this cartogram also shows you is articles normalized by population. So darker colors mean more articles per person. Lighter colors mean fewer per person. And um, this is something you see even more vividly on this graph, though. Uh, the, the green bars here indicate um, population, world population, or 
percentage of world population. The blue bars indicate uh, Wikipedia articles. So look at Asia, for instance. Asia has uh, over 60% of the world's population, but less than 10% of the world's Wikipedia articles. Contrast that to Europe, the bar next to Asia, where you see just over 10% of the world's population, but about 55-56% of the world's Wikipedia articles. You might think that a lot of this can be explained by internet penetration rates, right? Well, that's not entirely true. Remember this map of internet penetration that I showed you just a few minutes ago. It's made using the exact same style. There are obviously large inequalities in internet access around the world, but those, these uneven geographies of internet access that you're looking at here, they still don't explain all of this unevenness in Wikipedia that we see here. Now, just, just another quick way to look at Wikipedia article densities of replace. I made this map to, to resemble one of those Earth by, by night um, satellite photos. What I did here was shade each article by the number of words it contains. So redder dots mean that there's a, a longer, more fully fleshed out article about that place. A more yellow dot means that there's a shorter article or a stub article with very little in it. And what you, what you see uh, is that while there are a lot of articles about uh, Japan, for instance, and Europe especially, a lot of them tend to be these quite short articles, whereas if you contrast that to North America, where you see lots of sort of fully fleshed out, longer articles. But despite all of this, as we've already seen, there are just big parts of our world with nothing written about them at all. Something that really stands out in this map, when you see all of this, this glowing cluster of information in Europe, and you, you can con contrast that to the relative lack of content in the Middle East and in Africa. Now, there's one final thing that I'd like to talk about, and this might actually be the most important thing that I show you. So far, um, what we've just looked at is what people are creating content about, but what about where people are creating information from, where people are participating from? So uh, my team, Bernie Hogan, Ahmed Medhat, and myself, we, we got some of this information from Wikipedia, and we mapped it. And as you might have guessed, there are, again, some very stark geographic imbalances. This, what you're looking at here, is the number of edits to Wikipedia that come, that come from each country in the world. So basically where people are contributing from, where people are producing information from. And what we see is that the production of knowledge, again, is very distinct and uneven geographies. So by now you probably expect this story. You expect to see these inequalities. But what surprises me is just the scale of them. There's, there's more edits that come from Hong Kong, for instance, than all of Africa combined. Or you can see, you can see uh, this, these inequalities um, in the Middle East as well. Uh, you can see that there's almost as many edits that come from Israel, for instance, as the whole rest of the region combined. Now, our team's still working on examining the factors that might explain these, these very uneven geographies of content and participation. Is it literacy rates? Is it internet access? Is it GDP? Is it education levels? Well, we're still working on answering these questions, but we can ask maybe a broader question right now. We can ask more broadly, what do these maps tell us? Well, they tell us not only is there not a lot of content created from the developing world, there also isn't a lot of content created about the developing world. A lot of people and places are both literally and figuratively left off the map. And we can't simply explain this away by lack of internet access or by, by the argument that Wikipedia and similar platforms aren't popular platforms in the, these places. So the question then is why? Why when the world's getting wired, when internet penetration rates are rising rapidly, why are there still these very massive absences? And again, we're, we're still working on trying to answer these questions, but I think two very quick anecdotes might help us to move beyond some of the hype about how the internet will democratize participation and knowledge sharing from the global south. So I was first made aware of this quite interesting story in a blog post by Ethan Zuckerman. This, this guy that you're looking at here is called Mac Mendy. And Mac Mendy's this fictional tough guy character that became quite popular amongst the Kenyan internet community. And importantly, he was Kenya's first viral internet sensation, demonstrating that it's not just Europeans and Americans that can flood your, your Facebook news feed with cute sleeping kittens and dancing hamsters and all of the other memes I'm sure you're, you're inundated with. But the problem was when his Kenyan fans tried to create an entry for him in Wikipedia, the page kept being deleted by people saying that the page wasn't notable, that it was nonsense, that it was incomprehensible. It was none of those things. But the page kept being deleted because uh, the editors that were deleting the page, they were clearly from outside the region. They didn't understand the significance of this meme in East Africa. And there wasn't a way for the Kenyan editors to get this article to stick until Ethan Zuckerman blogged about it. And then CNN picked this up and covered it. And then finally, Mac Mendy could get a page that wasn't deleted. 
Now, the point of this story isn't that we need more articles about Kenyan superheroes, but that even well-educated and computer literate people in places like Kenya can face significant struggles and challenges when, when using and contributing to global platforms like this. Um, Heather Ford has written a very excellent book chapter about this incident that I put at the bottom of the slide there if any of you want to read more about this. Now, my second story also comes from Kenya. This is a picture from a session at a big conference that took place in Nairobi's conference center uh, last year, or about a year and a half ago. And on the screen was one of the maps of the submarine fiber optic cables that I showed you earlier, the exact same map I showed you earlier. Um, and the speaker was giving this, this impassioned talk about how faster internet speeds would fundamentally transform the region and allow a new kind of development to happen in the region and, and bring the region into a global knowledge economy. As he was speaking, the screen went blank and the lights turned off and it took a few seconds for a backup generator to bring power back to the room. What had happened was one of Nairobi's frequent power cuts interrupting him and the laughter in the room indicated that the irony of the situation wasn't really lost on anyone. Now what I think these two stories illustrate is that it can be easy to forget about a lot of these underlying structural and social barriers with all of the expectations and the buzz and the hype surrounding the internet in the developing world. So just to wrap this all up, I think we need to remember, first of all, that despite a rapid growth in internet access for much of the world, most people on our planet are still entirely disconnected. And second, even amongst those two billion that are now online, a significant number are still left out of global networks and debates and conversations. Even in our internet age, information is geographically sticky, and its production is characterized by very distinct digital divisions of labor that have in many ways just reinforced global patterns of visibility and representation and voice that we're used to in the offline world. So the issue isn't just that some people in the developing world are disconnected, but also that many of the benefits of the internet don't automatically arrive into the developing world once internet connections do. There are a lot of expectations that see the arrival of the internet and connectivity more broadly, some sort of panacea for development that it just can't live up to. So in other words, what I'm saying is that while the internet's obviously a prerequisite for a lot of economic development and a lot of participation that happens in the 21st century knowledge economy, we shouldn't forget that it's by no means a determinant of any of those things. Thank you very much. <laughs>